Minimalism is just an incredible way to simplify our lives and to really clear out the clutter in our mind. So much of our lives is seeing ads and buying things. And some people just go their whole lives accumulating a little more here and a little more there. And even if they never have to clean out their home, often their kids have to do it at some point because we call it hoarding now, this, uh, this constant accumulation of things. And we become emotionally attached to these things. And we also have this fear of them losing it or being stolen or breaking. And so all of this stuff we buy. Now I'm talking about the stuff we don't need that we just want in an impulse. It gives us a dopamine rush when we first have that thing. But even like a child who immediately loses interest in their favorite toy for some new shinier object, we are the same. We don't have a lasting joy that comes from owning any object. That dopamine rush is temporary. And if we chase that dopamine rush, that pleasure center of the brain, nothing will be enough. And we just keep buying and buying, hoping for happiness, fulfillment, and just feeling left empty. And part of the problem with the accumulation of things we don't need or the misperception that some object or new house, new car, will bring us lasting happiness. It all clutters the mind, not just our house, not just our storage locker. And every time, if we're in that accumulation mindset, that we see a commercial or we see a product in a store window, we go through this very long, very distracting, decision-making process of should I get it, should I not get it, can I afford it, can I not afford it? And we have that inner debate, that inner conflict with ourselves. And if we set an intention to be a minimalist and to only buy what we need, then we immediately are able to avoid all of that inner chatter. And instead of even wondering if we want something, we're just strolling on by without a thought in the world and we're just present and at peace. There's no comparing what someone else has to yourself because you're not in the accumulation game. There's no jealousy because you would rather have things that nourish your soul and body and you have no interest in these status symbols. So ultimately, it's, it's about decluttering your space and your mind. And this isn't to say that everyone should be a minimalist or that having nice stuff is unacceptable. It's simply taking back your mental peace from the confusion of too much choice, really taking back your own power, your own control over yourself, not being persuaded by advertising or the latest and greatest smartphone. And with this minimalist mindset, we appreciate what we have so much more. We have an inner joy that doesn't even compare to that shopping dopamine hit. And when we have inner joy, every single thing around us is merely a blessing on top of that. It's not that we're dependent on these external things for our happiness anymore. And when we do that, a real lasting peace and joy emerges instead of just chasing from this product to that product, this you know shirt to the new car upgrade that just came out. And so just like cleaning up our room allows us to subconsciously feel more mentally at peace. When we apply that to something as big as 
every product we buy, suddenly confusion of choice disappears and we really narrow in our decision-making process and our focus into, do I really need this? Is this the best thing for what I need? And there is no spending hours scrolling on our phones. If that is something that is just enjoyable for you, whether you buy something or not, that's not really what we're talking about. We're really just talking about that constant inner dialogue we have sometimes when we're bombarded with advertising, when there's a thousand storefronts on our walk to work, simply turning what could be chaotic, which is a million brands shouting a million messages at us into a force field around us and just living in this constant state of inner peace. Well, often the things we buy, the homes we own, can all begin to feel like prisons, cages, anchors holding us down. And so if we want to live a life of total freedom, getting rid of the things that we feel we would need to put into a storage locker or have to keep the house because of the mortgage payments or to keep all our other stuff, then getting rid of these things can feel like a weight has been lifted off our shoulders. Now, this isn't to say go give away all your things or live a life on the streets or <laughs> anything extreme like that. You know, getting rid of the things that we've been hoarding that aren't serving us, that we don't use regularly, and even in future, like buying a house that is within our price range instead of that big fancy one that we can't afford but we really want. These uh, are all decisions that can help us to remain in control, free to do what we want, not a slave to our own possessions. When I gave away all of my possessions in order to go live in monasteries and ashrams and in tribes in South America, for me it was a relief to be free from any time that I needed to come back, any monthly bills or payments I had to maintain, and to really just go where my heart drew me. But even if I were in one place for a long time, I have this now new perspective where I don't want so much that moving will be a nightmare <laughs> or that I would have to get a storage locker. It's just a real feeling of being able to be flexible and responsive to my needs, the needs of family and friends without anything holding us back. Really the greatest feeling in the world is to want nothing, to desire for nothing. This does not mean I have a mansion and everything I've ever wanted I own. <laughs> this really is simply a mindset that all I need is the clothes on my back, food at my next meal, and nothing more. I so often see people, often out loud, debating whether they should buy this thing or eat that thing. And when you have spent some time with yourself and understand what you really need, not what you want, but what you really need. Choice disappears because it's very clear. There is no choice. There is, I need this shirt. I don't have enough shirts. <laughs> you know, There is, I need this food because I haven't had protein in a while. There's just, this is what I need right now. You go and get that thing. And it has been very liberating to not have to spend hours and days debating whether or not I should do something or not. You know, we always confuse our wants with our needs. And we often say, oh, I need, I need a new iPhone <laughs> or I, uh, you know, need a new car. And, you know, these are wants. And I know it fe may feel like both those things 
our necessities, but we don't need the latest and greatest, and we don't need the most expensive, fanciest, or what other people think is cool, which goes into a lot of people's decision making. And these are all just feeding that comparative mindset, that ego-driven need for status. And to help just get out of your own way and to get the ego out of your way, it is very beneficial to place your self-worth not on the value of the things you surround yourself with, but on the value that you have given to other people and that you feel from within. The key to not craving new things is to simply experience the bliss and peace we have within. And to start, once you've experienced that, to start realizing and craving that more than anything else. And it's to have a moment of this awakening, this awareness, that we realize that all of this craving, external, temporary, material possessions is only going to take us further away from that inner peace, that inner joy that we all have within, that radiating love. Most of the time, since we're little kids, we're taught that a celebration, birthday, Christmas, means a gift, that that will bring us the greatest source of happiness. And when we live our whole lives like that, we don't take the time to nourish that joyful spirit within us. And so if we've never known that, then we constantly crave outside pleasures, whether it's shopping or any other kind of thing we crave. And when we can allow ourselves to find the peace in peaceful moments, instead of pulling out our phone or online shopping or anything to get away from that peace and quiet. Once we can just sit in that moment and feel that peace without resistance and we can embrace it and we can really allow it to rejuvenate us and reconnect to ourselves and to release that stress and anxiety we feel throughout most of the day, then there's nothing to run away from then there's no point in chasing external pleasures. And so we really just have to become aware of that peacefulness within us, that stillness, by allowing for that stillness to be experienced, to recognize how we've been trained to resist it since we were little children with constantly jam-packed schedules where every minute of the day was accounted for some activity, and to recognize the advertising and the branding and the stores and the shopping triggers around us. Recognize the unconscious reaction that is created within us. Notice the nature of that craving. Notice how it compares what other people have and that ego-driven craving for status. And just sit in that awareness and allow that to be without resistance. And then we can, in that stillness, tap into that peace. And we can recognize that one fulfills us, sustains us, and gives us energy. And the other one drains our energy, drains our mental peace, and drains our wallets. (laughs) When I gave away all my possessions, when my lease expired December 31st, and I had that plane ticket to India one way for January 6th or something, it was something that I had been planning for a long time and that I was 
really feeling a mix of finally it's here. This thing that I've told so many people for years about that they probably didn't believe was ever going to happen is really happening. So there's this sense of reality kicking in finally with this uh, plan of mine. And there was a little bit of fear, like this is the craziest thing anyone's ever done. Uh, you're going to go travel the world living in monasteries and ashrams and with shamans to study this spirituality thing. No idea what to expect. No idea if I'd even be able to get a job when I got back if I needed one. No idea if people still read books for the book I was writing about it. But my heart was 100% certain. And my brain was grasping for some safety net. But really, like my shaman told me, you know, follow your heart. Uh, it's the boss. And let your head follow. I think that part of the reason people are obsessed with possessing stuff is because since we're very little, we're taught that there's this physical world. There's, even in science, they, they teach the material view, which is that there are these physical objects and they work this certain way. So to think that there's something more kind of puts you in this quack <laughs> category. But we all are finally like learning in science even that there is this mysterious consciousness, this non-physical nature of who we are that is still a mystery. And it's largely been ignored by science because it's not easy to measure. It's not easy to even compare one person's happiness to another person's happiness. So they kind of stay back, stay away from it. They like what we can measure and test and repeat. And so people become very focused on the stuff and we miss the connections and the relationships and the energy that is flowing all around us. And so we put more value in our society on achieving, acquiring. So many people I know, I swear they just want to raise or to make more money so they can waste more money. <laughs> they want to work harder so they can spend more money, have um, things they don't need. And all of society says that that's a good idea, that workaholism is the best addiction anyone could have because we live in this you must achieve society and so this plays right into the ego trap this um, comparison need to have more than the next guy the problem with more is that it never ends there is never enough to anybody you know elon musk has not retired he is still wants more <laughs> And these are often the heroes of our society. These, uh, these super successful celebrities that are idolized for their work ethic or some, some achievement. And so the media plays into this game where we all want to achieve and be like these people because that's who are the heroes of the media. There's not as much coverage for the nonprofits that feed the poor or the doctor who checks on the homeless. And so because there's no advertisements for being a good person, we instead are bombarded with these messages to buy. And these messages have an impact. And if we don't give people the 
write messages, if we don't explain to people that there is a inner source of love and bliss within each one of us, you simply have to tune out the noise and turn inward to find it. There's no money in that, really. <laughs> but we can, we can get those messages out on places like YouTube. And if we have enough of that message, then our values won't be so skewed towards possession, ownership, and accumulation. As strange as it may seem, sitting down and doing nothing is one of the hardest things for most people. It's that turning off the TV, putting down the phone, and just sitting with yourself, with your thoughts, close your eyes, and just observe your breath. Easiest thing in the world, really, but one of the hardest things we can do. But each time we do that, we are creating a very strong neural pathway in our brain for discipline. And this discipline can be extended to how clean we keep our room, to how healthfully we're eating, to getting to the gym. Literally, anyone whose life feels out of control, meditation is the mind training activity that will affect everything else we do. And so when we sit in meditation, we don't just sit and have a blank mind. Thoughts will come and go. And what is happening is we are, by tuning out distraction, we are becoming aware of our own mental processes. And so we become to think more consciously as we become more conscious of our thoughts. And when we are conscious of these thoughts, we'll have insights and ideas come into our mind. We'll have problems that we need to focus on that can come into our mind in this peaceful state where we can think clearly about them. And so oftentimes that can mean we bring some analytical conscious thinking to tidying up our room, thinking about things we can get rid of that we don't need. And in general, we can not just organize our room, we can organize our day. We can organize our lives. We can give ourselves the time to think about that one year, five year, 10 year plan. Oftentimes we don't give ourselves to just think. And so there's actually a very powerful meditation practice where we will sit and we'll either focus on a mantra or our breath. And then about five or seven minutes later, we will consciously think about something that we need to address in our lives, whether it's hoarding and a mess <laughs> or whether it's you know, figuring out our, our future, whatever it is, we can get into this meditative state, spend some time analytically thinking about whatever is on our mind, and then going back to, you know, five minutes on that, five minutes on thinking about something, back to five minutes meditating. And what we're doing is we're allowing our conscious mind to settle down to get into a peaceful state and to communicate with our conscious, subconscious, and unconscious minds so that they're all talking to each other, so that we create lasting change and that we create new patterns and habits for ourselves that will unfold into our lives as well. I think that maximalism and minimalism are like two sides of the same coin, opposite sides, and completely different in terms of unconscious thinking versus conscious thinking, excessive consumption versus the bare minimum. But it's, it's all under this one consumption coin. Sometimes it gets tricky to see where the middle path is, where the centered 
balanced path is. But because we live in a overconsumption society, we think minimalism is the extreme. But really, asceticism is the extreme end of maximalism, opposite end. And minimalism really is that middle path. It's not going without the things you need. It's not starving yourself. It's just that middle path of having what you need. Occasionally, you know, you may appreciate the, the finer things in life or gifts when they're presented, but you don't look to those things for lasting happiness. And maximalism, on the other hand, can put you into bankruptcy and can make us unhealthy. So minimalism really is that middle path. It's simply rising above the distractions, the messaging, the impulses, and allowing our higher wisdom, our highest intention to govern ourselves and our behavior. It's important that we always look at everything we do from a holistic perspective and not at the symptom level. Minimalism or excessive consumption are simply symptoms of a mental state. And whether we are trying to fill a hole inside of us through excess consumption or we're chasing after some sense of enlightenment and we are using minimalism as the route for that. These behaviors stem from the mind. That is the holistic perspective. That is the source of everything we do, is our state of consciousness and whether we are radiating love, peace, and joy, or we are chasing those things from an external perspective. When we are fully content, fully satisfied and at peace, we don't buy things we don't need to make us happier. We don't consume unhealthy things to give us that immediate pleasure sensation. Every addiction, whether it's shopping or addiction to some chemical, these are symptoms. And if we are chasing something externally as the source of our inner peace, we will only find misery, even if it's minimalism. That being said, the things we do can impact our lasting mental state. So if we declutter our surroundings, our minds become less cluttered. If we eat healthy, we feel better and we're more able to discover that inner peace within. So certain things we do can either pull us in the right direction or into the wrong direction. But if we chase those things as the answer, we will mistake the solution, which will bring everything we do into balance for some symptom of that balance. And it's important to not allow some healthy, positive activity to create its own distress and inner turmoil. And so that just means we need to always be mindful and focus our attention inwards to recognize that something we are doing is causing stress and anxiety instead of peace, relaxation, and a greater sense of fulfillment in life. In everybody's life, there's going to be times when we're bombarded by salespeople or even friends and loved ones saying, you know, hey, you'd love this. Do you want that? You know, that kind of thing. It's just constant. And sometimes it's like 10 salespeople all at once and you're just like bombarded. So something that I have adopted personally that really works for me is my default answer is no to every single salesperson, to any family member, whatever anybody says, would you like this? I say no. And then I think about it. And maybe I walk back and say, you know what? I do need that actually. But 
Then I allow myself to have the time to really think, do I need this? Is this something I'll use? Is this going to add value to my life? Is this essential? Do I have the funds for this? You know, all of the decision making process cannot take place in that impulse buy where we see an ad and we click on it or we respond to a salesperson who knows that they, if they just keep talking while you are contemplating a purchase that you don't have time to think because all you're hearing is their voice. And this is a great tactic if you're a salesperson, <laughs> but if you are a um, impulse buyer, it's a great tactic to say no, walk away, and then you can always walk back. You know, no salesperson is going to be mad that you decided to buy a thing. So that's a super great technique for resisting any impulse buy and just giving yourself the time to really think about it not just that base impulse, but really allow that higher wisdom to come into effect. Besides the countless hours that I save shopping online or in person, minimalism has even saved my time because when I consciously try to own the bare minimum what i do own i make sure is very good quality will last a very long time and some people think that that's not minimalism to i should get the cheapest product possible but what i found in my life is that the cheapest product is going to need to be replaced every few months and that a good quality product can last 20, 30 years. So this is minimalism in the long run with the bigger perspective. And in the amount of time I've saved myself from having to buy, you know, replace broken things or spend time making something that's not well made work is another aspect of minimalism which is to say that we all need good tools and that a good tool can save you time in the long run can save you money in the long run it's much cheaper to buy one quality pair of headphones than constantly every six months replacing a broken pair so there's many ways that minimalism can help us really focus on what matters and what's important and is something a little more expensive going to save me money in the long run gonna save space in a landfill later because I don't have to throw away so much stuff these are all ways we can focus our decision-making process when we have a minimalistic mindset and Another beautiful benefit from minimalism is that the less stuff I have around, the more time I have to meditate, the more time I have to call friends and family and nourish relationships. And it's, it's a really remarkable thing, but the more we get rid of stuff we don't need, the more time we have for the stuff that really matters. And that is a wonderful aspect of minimalism. You know, so many people say, I don't have the time to meditate, or maybe they do have the time, but they're constantly distracted by gadgets or other tasks or things that all of the possessions we own in ways they complicate our lives uh, makes it more difficult to meditate. So by simply simplifying our lives we can really invest in the things that pay off later and in big dividends the things that make us happier in the long run which is the meditation which is better relationships and that's really the difference with overconsumption which is happiness now but misery later from not having enough money or 
constantly chasing that new item, that new car smell, that new possession feeling. And instead, just a little bit of restraint and delaying that instant grati gratification can really make us happier in the long run, which is what we're truly all seeking. For me, the greatest tips, tricks, techniques I have for maintaining a minimalist lifestyle is really three things. Number one, making the purchase decision a conscious decision, which is to say, running through the list of questions for yourself. Do I really need this? Will I really use this? So much we think we'll use and we end up never using. And it even goes for a house too. So much, uh, so many people when they are buying a house, they think they want this, they'll spend a lot of time in this reading room and then they're never in the reading room, you know, or they think they'll spend a lot of time in this room, but they never go in that room. And, and oftentimes we're the same way. So sometimes someone will buy a big fancy camera and they'll realize that it's just too big to take anywhere and they never use it. And so these are just kind of scenarios to run down in our mind, like, do we really need it? Will I really use it? And why do I want it? These are the most essential questions that we can ask ourselves with any purchase. And if the answer is yes, and if we want it because, you know, it'll help with our job or our passion, these are great reasons. You know, if it's to have this slightly new feature or it looks really cool, maybe we don't need it, you know. And the second tip is to really be adamant with your nose and to make that your default, which is to say, you know, when someone offers you something, you can apply this uh, same technique, which is, you know, do you really need it? Do you really want it? Are you going to end up throwing it away in a couple years? And the third tip for being minimalist is kind of always think about the future and not just the present moment. So when I move, will this be a pain to move or will this you know, be something I'm glad to have and move? Because that's ultimately one of those things. For me, I really want a thousand books. I want a million books. I want all the books. <laughs> Um, instead, I have them all on my e-reader, and sure, I would love a cool fancy library right behind me, but that would make moving a big pain. That would cut down a lot of trees, and I don't want it for any particular reason than to have behind me and show off. <laughs> so that's not a good reason. You know, my Kindle is super great, just everything I need, and uh, I can take every book with me. It's, it's way better. But, um, you know, we all have that, like, sentimental desire for the physical object. And I think that that sentimental desire is something that we all have to some extent. And that uh, advertising plays off of. You know, it, it always shows us in, it shows us those scenes of very sentimental moments and very touching and that really pull on our emotions, but those aren't really great reasons to buy stuff. So if we remember those three things, we'll be in good shape. Minimalism for me is like a superpower. It has made me immune to advertising and it has allowed me to just rise above any material wants and desires. And that is the greatest feeling in the world. I've always said that the richest person on earth isn't the 
man or woman who has everything, but it's the person who wants for nothing. And we all know those rich people who there's never enough. They don't appreciate what they have. And they, they always feel like they're almost poor. Like they need so much more money to have the life they want. And then we know people that are in the lower socioeconomic class and everything is a blessing and everything is a miracle. And there is no question who is happier. And the beauty is you can be rich and a minimalist. You can be, you can have a big house with lots of stuff and be a minimalist. It is simply a mentality that puts your highest intentions and wisdom in control of your purchasing habits. It is about appreciating what you have and not letting the things you own, own you. It is about enjoying the pleasures of life without expecting happiness to come from those things. And so we don't become addicted to shopping. We don't endlessly chase more money and more materialism at the expense of our friends and family and our own mental and physical health. And it's such an incredible feeling to be able to walk down the street and see all the people getting hypnotized by the shiny objects in the storefront windows and it having zero effect on me, creating no desire, stirring up no passion or craving, and simply just maintaining my peacefulness no matter what uh, is around me, whether I have it or don't have it. There's no comparisons, there's no competitive mindset with anyone else. There is simply feeling like I have everything in the world and feeling like the richest guy in the world. No, it's not that my views changed or that I changed going from advertising to minimalism. I would actually say that seeing how advertising works from the inside gave me a awareness of the tricks and incredible graphics and all the tools of modern media used to convince us to buy things we don't need. And so by learning those tricks, they slowly stopped working on me. And I realized where in my own life I was wasting money or trying to look the coolest or comparing myself to what others have achieved. And just realizing this running on a rat wheel is getting us nowhere. And that it's much more fun to get off, just step off that rat wheel because it won't take you anywhere and it's exhausting. <laughs> and so towards the end of my time in advertising, I started to more and more adopt this minimalist mindset and just finding that there was so much more joy when you have everything you need and you want for nothing than there is in wanting the bigger apartment or in the better neighborhood or having even more expensive clothes and all the things we all are chasing but that don't improve our lives. And luckily, you don't have to work in advertising because the evidence is right in front of all of our eyes. We see it every day walking down the street or opening our phone or turning on the TV is these flashy graphics and mouth-watering food or supermodels and cool clothes and 
all these things that kind of subliminally tell you that you are not enough, you're not good looking enough, you know, you are missing out on this product. And when we adopt a minimalist mindset, all of that is just like background noise. And it's like taking off the sunglasses from the movie They Live or putting them on, I guess, and seeing the uh, behind the scenes. There really is a, a subliminal message in, in all the media we consume. And you can really start to become aware of that when you simply let that game of chasing stuff be somebody else's game. And then you can just find the humor in all of this manufactured desire. So that's what I noticed uh, in advertising. And I, and I feel very blessed to have been in that position because it really is the behind the scenes to how this whole game is laid out before us. And, you know, if that's the game for you, go for it. But if you are looking for true happiness, you won't find it there. Whether it's the lottery or it's fancy clothes, I've noticed since I was a little kid that people who didn't have a lot of money were spending a lot of money on name brands or these luxury items that even I wasn't getting. And part of this is a trick to keep people spending, keep their egos striving for more status, but ultimately keeping people from saving and investing in themselves. And if we all were to suddenly become content with what we have and not feel the need to project an image. If we were free from addiction to junk foods and tobacco and alcohol, the number of people who could lift themselves out of their situations would grow exponentially. And that's one of the greatest benefits of minimalism is being able to really save and invest in yourself. When you think that happiness comes from these material items, then when you are in a moment of lowness, when you're feeling stressed or sad or anxious, you're going to buy that stuff. You're going to waste your money. When you know that the source of lasting happiness comes from within, then you aren't chasing it outside. And you are keeping all of that energy instead of expending it and you can put it into your passions, your dreams, and that would be a different looking world.